you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the, world. in the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. This is Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. There are many things, but that makes it official. Welcome to Big Show. We certainly appreciate you guys being here. As always, the Chris Foss Show family is a family that loves you but doesn't judge you. At least not as much as your, at least not as harshly as your mother-in-law. She never liked you anyway. But get on her good side. Refer the show to her family, friends, and relatives. Go to Goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Foss, LinkedIn.com, Fortress Chris Foss, Chris Foss One on the TikTokity, and Chris Foss Facebook.com. We have an amazing multi-book author on the show. He's out with his, I believe, third book. It's called called Lost Man's Lane. A novel comes out March 26, 2024. Scott Carson joins us on the show. He's going to be talking about his latest book, what's inside of it, and why you should buy it now. Like, do it now. Do it now. Scott Carson is a New York best Times bestselling author whose work has been translated into more than 20 languages, adapted into major motion pictures, and won the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. He's a former private investigator and reporter. His writing has been praised by Stephen King, Michael Connolly, and Dean Kuntz, among many others. He was raised in Bloomington, Indiana, and now lives in Indiana and Maine. Welcome to the show, Scott. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Give us your dot coms. Where do you want people to find you on the interwebs? Yeah, at scottcarsonbooks.com. And, you know, Facebook, Instagram, all those fun places as well. So there you go. Now, do I have that count right? You have got three books out? So I, I actually have three books out under the name Scott Carson. Okay. And then I have 14 under the name Michael Carita, K O R Y T A, which is the, the Scott Carson thing came about because I sort of wanted to brand off for the supernatural stuff, the thrillers that are more in like the Stephen King, Joe Hill vein. And then I also do some, under the Carita name, I write more traditional detective novels, crime novels, things of that sort. And how many books do you have over there on that on that designation? The uh, the, the Carita side of things has 14, and uh, Car- Carson's lagging behind, but we're going to get him caught up here. There you go. There you go. Focusing on that. So do you flip back and forth between the two? Do you put a book out here and a, on one side and the book out on the other? Yeah. So last year I had a, a book under the Carita name that was, as I said, but more of a straightforward crime thriller, you know, no, no ghosts, nothing strange, no supernatural. And then this year it's a Scott Carson and we've, you know, we've, we've got it all in this one. We have the detective element, but we also have some nice, you know, Ghosts, spooky things, and hopefully a lot of fun. Lost Man's Lane. So give us a 30,000 overview, a tease out, if you would, of the book. Yeah, it's set in Bloomington, Indiana, my hometown, in 1999. And the protagonist is a 16-year-old kid who ends up with an internship at this kind of unique detective agency. And the opening of the book features him. He's a witness to... He's the last person to see a girl who has disappeared Uh-oh. and he sees her in the back of a police car. When he identifies this police officer, it turns out that the cop doesn't exist. He's not really a member of the local police force at all. So that kind of kicks things into gear. And from there it's, I, I would say a hybrid of coming of age story and that, you know, supernatural thriller. There you go. Supernatural thriller. I imagine a lot of your influence seems to come from your locale of Indiana. So I guess you write what you know. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that because this is the first book I've set in my hometown. Oh, really? And I, I was also, when I was in high school, I had an internship with this detective. I turned that actually was my day job for a little while until, you know, I went into writing full time. 
And it seems like an obvious thing to write about. You know, this, mm -hmm. as you say, it's a write what you know and, and write about a place that you know. But it took me 20 years to actually come back. And then, and then when I finally arrived back home, I even did that under a pseudonym. So there's an odd level of distance here for something so close to there you go. What? Yeah, it looks like your background being a detective or private investigator. Do I yes. have those? Are they the same thing, basically, or is there a difference? From a PI and a private detective, no. I mean, just different there terminology. You same, same same thing. Thing. You never know, Dan. There's terms for everything now, and they're, they're all unique. <laughs> it's like, don't call me this, call me that. Let's see. So you, you were a former private investigator and reporter. Did you do newspaper reporting, TV Things yeah, like I worked for a newspaper, did police beat there. For, and, and some of the events that are in this book, as I mentioned, from 1999 to 2000, and that was the era when I began to work at the newspaper. So one of the crimes that is sort of, it's not central to the book, but it was very central to the inspiration. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a guy who came through my town and it was on the 4th of July in 99. His name was Ben Smith, and I don't know if you remember this guy, but he shot someone in Chicago, shot and killed the Northwestern basketball coach in Chicago, and then went on this multi-state race-based killing spree, and he passed through Bloomington and shot a Korean Indiana University student outside of a church. And a few years later, when I was working at, at the newspaper and in the police beat, I ended up sitting down with the guy who was his inspiration for lack of a better term wow. his name was matt hale and that was just and those crimes it was so shocking in this you know we weren't mayberry but i think there was the sense of being in a very safe community this bucolic sort of idyllic college town and so that that crime really it stuck with me and i wanted to come back and write about it but not about that topic mm -hmm. you know i didn't want to dig into I didn't want to give a voice to the Matt Hale kind of movement. Yeah. And what I wanted to do was capture this, you know, my town, the way I remembered it. And some of the questions that came out of that about, you know, the community and okay, was this, was this guy homegrown or it was the threat coming at us from the outside. And I wanted to explore all of that within this coming of age uh, framework. I've always loved books like, you know, The Body, which became Stand By Me, like Stephen King, that, that's oh, yeah. a big influence. And A Prayer for Owen Meany by John Irving. So those, are, those seem like wildly different, but that same kind of idea. So it sounds like, I think we've had a few different authors on the show that also did beat reporting and newspaper reporting on, on you know, what was going on with the police and, you know, there are things. And uh, so to, likely a lot of that exposure gives you a lot of material for stories and writing and and the suspense i guess since some of it's trying to solve mysteries and puzzles and find criminals etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah without a doubt i think the other thing that it brings is a discipline to the writing practice mm -hmm. you know when, when you're in the newspaper business no one is interested in hearing about your lack of inspiration or how you're you're waiting on the muse you know that doesn't fly when you go to press at 3 a.m. You know, I think writers who were very influential to me and became sort of mentor figures early on, Michael Connolly and Laura Lippman were both, you know, beat reporters. And I always admired those writers who, they were able to generate a book a year at a high quality. And I, I do think there's something about having been in the newsroom, having that background Obviously, it informs the work on a detail side, but it's also just the, the on the craft side. You've got to show up every day and put down, you know, put down your words. There you go. There you go. That's having that having that motivation and get things done is probably really important. When you when you added, tell us a little bit about how you grew up. Like, what what motivated you want to get into writing? When did you know you were a writer per se? What were some of the influences that got you there as you were raised as a child? You know, I, I think I wanted to be a writer from the moment I understood you could make a living doing it. Like once I understood that could be a job, it's what I wanted to do. And in, within this genre in particular, my father was a big like film noir fan. So, mm -hmm. you know, you think Humphrey Bogart and, you know, those Philip Marlowe, Sam Spade kind of movies. 
Alfred Hitchcock, stuff like that. He was was very into those older films. So I would say I probably was driven to this genre as a writer more from um, movies than books, even oh. at, at an early age. And then what were some uh, movies that influenced you, if you can recall any? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, really, the the one that stands out to me is The Big Sleep oh. and Key Largo, both Bogart movies, but. You know, they just had that great, it's, you know, very noir, very of its time period, but the Key Largo really stands out for whatever reason. I was very young when I saw that mm -hmm. and that, that one lingers all the Hitchcock stuff too. Oh, and then when I was, I was probably so way too young when I saw the shining, I think I was maybe 10 or 11, <laughs> but that one made an impression you. that the shining and jaws are, are the <laughs> lasting memories for me. There you go. I'm a big Bogey fan. I still think he's one of the greatest nice. actors in the world. I, I I can watch Bogey movies all day long. Absolutely. Key Largo was so great. The Big Sleep. Wasn't The Big Sleep, was that the first one that he had his wife in? Or who eventually became his wife? Or... No, I think the, the very first one with Lauren Bacall was To Have and Have Not. Okay, yeah, that's right. That's right. And yeah. Yeah, they were. She's also, she's in Key Largo, too. Yeah. The one thing I the one thing I hate is every time I watch the movies I see him smoking and I'm just like, dude, that's gonna kill you. I can see the <laughs> and it did, yes, it exactly. Did, yeah. It's like, like no one ever looked better smoking a cigarette and <laughs> it it came for him. Yeah, but I mean he was such a man's man. I got lucky enough recently, the local symphony here in Utah, they played the movie Casablanca and it was so cool because they did the they played the music through the movie and oh, I think nice. some of the sound effects as God, you know, you, you listen to the movie and I think you can hear sometimes in the sound, you know, like sp the sparks in the track or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. a little <laughs> and so listening to the fullness of a symphony behind it was just amazing, man. That had to be. It was That's like a watching, very cool idea too. Yeah. It was like watching the movie, like, it is if it was produced now in black and white for fun, you know, like they do. And but the sound just, I mean, just made the movie come alive in a whole new way for me. And I've watched it like a billion times, but yeah. So some of those influences for you, Jaws, of course, that thing, The Shining. I mean, it, that thing, that movie still freaks me out to this day. Oh, That's absolutely. Still a hard movie to so watch. then I promptly went to read the book, <laughs> oh, and that that was my first Stephen King read. So there, there are two, King has been a huge influence and also a really generous, unbelievably generous guy and a supporter of younger writers too. I, he is, I think he and Michael Connolly are just in a different league in terms of they're at a level where they don't have to worry about paying it forward. And yet mm -hmm. that is such an important thing to those guys, but King's, so King's fiction was important. The, then his book on writing, I don't know if you ever read that, that came mm -hmm. out when I was like 18 years old. Mm -hmm. And that was so helpful because it, it pulled the curtain back on, you know, what this guy was doing. And I loved how concrete it was. He gets down into the nuts and bolts of, you know, just write clean sentences, write strong, cut out the adverbs. And to, to know that someone who has that level of imagination mm -hmm. was also a craftsman who is, you know, going about it in the same way that I'm attempting to with mm -hmm. my amateur efforts was unbelievably encouraging. It's a great book. Wow. That, is that one on writing, a memoir? On writing, craft? yes. There mm -hmm. you go, 2010. Exactly. I, I should check that book out because I'm trying to get my second book written. And I'm a, it's nonfiction, so we're not writing the great novels you guys do. We're writing about, you know, stupid you've got the You've got the background for it, though. If you ever wanted to... Write a novel. I mean, I would think Something. you have to have some stories to call on, right? Definitely, definitely. We have the business stories to do it. What's the What's the future that you've got working on the book? Uh, uh, are you working on the other series, or you see more coming out on this one, or what's What's the future looking like for you? Yeah, right now I'm working on a script actually for an adaptation of a book that came out last year. That one was called An, an Honest Man. And I'm working with the producers who did Mayor of Easttown. I don't know if you saw that really good show on HBO. So. No. I'm not a big TV watcher. I, I just don't get time. I'm a big podcaster. Podcaster and reader. I like it. 
<laughs> there you go. Yeah, I just don't. I just don't find time to sit down and do the thing. But reading's important. I my Audible just eats up. I eat so much stuff between driving, going places, and then the gym. I can. Oh, I, a lot. I love Audible. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm listening to a ton of books. In fact, I just heard you on. You were on Huberman's podcast not long ago. You might be thinking of the other Chris Voss. I'm the original Chris Voss. You're the original, okay. I'm the original Chris Voss. I started the Chris Voss brand 16 years ago. (laughs) He, Christopher Voss, if you pull his wiki page, his name is Christopher Voss, which he goes by. He hijacked our brand in 2016 because he had no followers and built his brand off of our brand. So, well, there already you've got another story. Yeah, I got a lot of stories about that. I've got I've got the emails telling him what a fuck tart he was. But yeah, <laughs> who knew people from the FBI were great thieves? It's shocking, right? Shocking. I joke about the FBI, but we love the FBI. I think we've got Frank Faguzzi on again later this year. Any other tease outs you want to do to people about the book? I know with novels we can't give too much about the middle and the ending, of course. Any other tease outs you want to give out about the book? Yeah, I would just say I, I had more fun writing this one than anything else I've done. I, there was something about going back and, and writing that era of 99 is such an interesting time capsule year mm-hmm. in terms of, I feel like we were right on the edge of a very different world and feeling very safe at that point in time. But one of the things that I really enjoyed from a research standpoint was when you talk about Y2K now, almost everyone thinks, that it was funny and nothing happened, you know, but it took billions of dollars for nothing to happen. And I didn't realize until I started the research on it, how deep into the Y2K prepper world some people went. And there's this culture of paranoia that I feel like we were, we were just starting to edge up against that was right there. And I, I, I really enjoyed research drives a lot of, of, you know, what I do and going back to that era, seeing, you know, from Columbine to Y two K, the sort of increasing just American tension was was really interesting. There you go. Do you think maybe that's what started the whole breaking of our innocence and going down the conspiracy road, where you know we we kind of live in a highly crazy conspiracy sort of world right now you know there's shortly after 1999 was you know the 9-11 and different things do you think that we you think maybe that was the beginning of i don't know the end or (laughs) yeah that's that's exactly what it began to feel like Mm -hmm. to me and it it was perfect for this kind of coming of age book because i think it, it was a moment of lost innocence and i mentioned columbine earlier you know that was april 99 then you have you know, 9-11, I think those are interesting bookends for, and in the middle is the thing that didn't happen, but was deepening this sort of paranoia and maybe more of an insular, I I don't know if I can trust the institution to protect me, uh-huh. you know, so th- there's that sort of, I, I would say the opening of that door of conspiracy thinking, and it's, uh, it wasn't in 99, but we're not long after Waco either. Oh, that's so right. There are these yeah. different threads that were, were beginning to be pulled, I think. Yeah, it's interesting. And that began the unraveling of of our mind. And uh, I don't know. It's it, 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 it's interesting you you, you uh, found that as a, as a beginning marker point. I'm going to have to think about this some more because it, it's kind of weird how we've we've just become unraveled ever since. And it just it doesn't seem to be getting any better. Like seems like nowadays, every time you go on Facebook or Twitter, there's a new conspiracy about everything. Oh, about everything. Exactly. It's not, it's hardly limited to the political sphere. There is, there is someone with a, you know, an alternate theory about everything. And this sort of perpetual distrust that I think we might've been just arriving at the early days of that in that 99, 2000 era that's also the moment when everything started we became so hyper connected. Yeah, yeah. We started on the internet. So you know, yep. there's a, a comedian that said one time, I don't want to steal the material. There's a comedian that said one time that before the internet, stupid people and and it just you know they'd be in the park talking themselves, yelling at themselves, holding signs, the world ends tomorrow, and you know everyone would just walk by and ignore them and be like, or sometimes commit them to a crazy farm. But the internet allowed all the crazy people to gather up get together and form groups and 
now we have the internet. So, <laughs> That's, so it's funny you mentioned that because the guy I was talking about with the, the crime that went through Bloomington in 99, the, the guy who was sort of behind it, mm -hmm. Matt Hale, who was this, I mean, just, you know, white supremacist lunatic who was currently in federal prison. But when I met with him as a reporter, he told me that where I saw him and his group as this fringe movement, I was failing to understand the reach of the internet. Mm -hmm. And the, the way he talked about it was essentially the public square was disappearing mm -hmm. and people could, you know, stay with, within the privacy of their own home. They didn't need to go out and publicly identify with a movement or a theory yet, but they could still support it. And at, at that time, I think this interview would have been in 2000, mm -hmm. yeah, 2000, maybe 2001. But at that time, I thought, oh, this guy, there's no, he's not right about this. And he was closer to right than I wanted to be. <laughs> you know, he was, in that regard, he was, he saw more of the internet than I did. He Absolutely. understood more of it. That's, that's amazing. And, you know, it, like recently with the Super Bowl thing with Taylor Swift, like I was just right. astounded at the stupidity of some of the conspiracy theories that got floated. It just became like it seemed like it was never going to end. I'm like, Jesus, can we get this thing over with? Because <laughs> can we just move move along? Yeah, move along. Like you know, everything from you know she's a robot or an alien from space. You know, just weird stuff that you're just like, and you're just like, seriously, she's just a young lady who plays music and she likes a guy in the NFL. I mean. Can we just, you know, what's there, is there own line that sometimes the simplest things are the most true, but, but you know, there's, I don't know. I think people yeah, want to it, believe it's tough me. when, you know, professionally I'm supposed to be coming up with crazy plots <laughs> and crazy people. And now I can't outpace the news. Yeah. You can't, you can't beat the internet, but it's interesting. Well, it makes for good fodder for your book. So there you go. Yeah. Give people the final pitch out to order up your book, pick it up in the dot coms where people can find you on the internet. Yeah, thank you. It's scottcarsonbooks.com or michaelcarita.com, K-O-R-Y-T-A. And the book is Lost Man's Lane, and that is out March 26th. There you go. And it's even billed at the top, A Master by Stephen King. So you got the plug in there. That's awesome. He's a, he, Like I said, he is a generous guy. There you go. Order up the book, folks. Wherever fine books are sold, it's Lost Man's Lane. Lane, a novel by Scott Carson, and it's available where you can get it on order on March 26, 2024. So pre order it now and be able to read it before everyone else in your book club does. Thank you very much for coming on the show, Scott. We really appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. And thanks, Your Honest, for tuning in. Go to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Foss, LinkedIn.com, Fortress Chris Foss, Chris Foss One, the TikTokity, and all those other crazy places on the internet. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. And we'll see you guys next time. And that should have us out.